Hello and welcome to Olsen & Bird's Weekly Client Update. Today's session is Global and Tangible low Tax Income. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Scott Harty. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Scott Hardy. I'm a partner in our federal and international tax group here at Alston & Bird. And this morning, Heather Ripley, who is based in our New York office, uh, is joining me. And Heather is going to review um, the guilty rules and related implications. Um, we've had a lot of guidance that come out lately, um, not only related to guilty, but uh, kind of tangential issues that implicate guilty calculations and implications. So we're going to try to review that as best we can in 30 minutes. Um, just to review quickly, slides should be available. Um, if you can't access the slides, some people like to go through the slides at a different pace than we might flip through them. So hopefully you can actually download, download those under the resources section on uh, your web on the screen. Um, as always, prior presentations are available, so feel free to access those if you want to go back and review them or look at the slides. And looking forward after this, there's some, we've, we're adding a few additional uh, presentations um, related to uh, some new provisions that have come out. So next week, I think we're looking at the previously taxed EMP rules. Uh, we're going to turn to foreign tax credits after that. And then we're adding two additional presentations or webinars on uh, the new 250 proposed regs and the implications of 962 elections. So um, look out for that. We will send a, an invite on those um, later today. So today, let me turn to kind of our roadmap <clears throat> and um, what, where we're going to go today. Um, it will be a bit challenging only because uh, there's a lot to review, and Guilty has a lot of tentacles that, um, that spread out and touch a lot of other topics, whether they be the, the foreign tax credit rules or the new 250 provisions. And so we're going to try and cover as much of that as we can um, at a high level. So we're going to start with um, just a review of uh, the guilty rules so we can level set for everyone. Um, some of that will be uh, basic for you, but just want to make sure we're all on the same page. And then we're going to turn our attention to just the proposed regulations and then conclude by looking at some of the other provisions and implications under uh, recently released guidance. So that's kind of our roadmap for today. Um, always please uh, send in questions. If you have questions at any time during the call, just email them to us. We will try to answer those. And if we don't, we will um, get back to you uh, separately after the call. Uh, so let me just um, introduce Heather real quick. Heather's practice focuses on federal and international tax matters for both corporations and individuals. Um, she's advised clients on uh, treaty implications, FATCA, FERPTA, uh, inbound tax issues, and um, anti-deferral regime for outbound investments, uh, including structuring and um, transactional matters. So, um, Heather, I just want to thank you for participating in this and uh, being with us this morning. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So let me just kind of, let me turn to um, just a, a, an overview of the guilty rules before we turn to the proposed regulation. So under new section 951 cap A, for years beginning after 1231-17, um, U.S. shareholders of controlled foreign corporations have to include, similar to subpart F, their pro rata share of the controlled foreign corporations guilty. And just stepping back, big picture, um, tax reform was designed to try and implement a bit of a territorial system whereby dividends from foreign corporations paid to U.S. corporate shareholders would um, be eligible for a dividends received deduction. Um, but to make sure that low tax or untaxed foreign income uh, essentially had a minimum amount of foreign tax being paid so that essentially there was no tax being paid anywhere. The U.S. wanted to make sure that there was a minimum tax, and so we have guilty um, to ensure that. And so we have a, an inclusion of income from abroad um, that will be picked up by U.S. Corp U.S. shareholders. And as long as a certain amount of tax is being paid, then there should be no residual U.S. tax. And in order to make that minimum tax work, 
Section 250 of the code allows corporate shareholders to take a 50% deduction for their guilty inclusion. So the effective rate on guilty for U.S. corporate shareholders is 10.5%, uh, so half of the, the corporate rate. Um, and legislative history indicates as long as the foreign, the CFC is paying about a 13%, 13 and one eighth percent rate, then uh, there should be no residual U.S. tax on that guilty inclusion. Now there uh, are some limitations on that deduction, um, which we'll uh, we'll discuss a little later. And also the deduction decreases beginning in 2026. And so um, whereas the rate, the foreign, the amount of foreign taxes needed to cover any residual U.S. tax uh, might be lower now. That will steadily, that will increase in 2026 as the deduction on guilty inclusion decreases. Um, also note that deduction is not available for individuals, um, but we will discuss um, a 962 election where individuals may uh, be entitled to that deduction. But generally 250 is not um, available for individuals. So their inclusion would be full. The other way that the code addresses um, a guilty inclusion is you get a deduction for the amount of guilty that you pick up, but you also get uh, to uh, claim foreign tax credits. So the U.S. corporate shareholder is allowed to claim um, an 80% deemed paid foreign tax credit for the taxes attributable to the guilty inclusion. And there's a complicated formula, but essentially what you're looking at is the amount of taxes attributable to the inclusion. So you take your inclusion percentage, um, so the guilty relative to your tested uh, foreign income, uh, and then you take 80% of that. So 80% of that is essentially what your foreign tax credit is, which is how you get to the 13 and 1 8 percent uh, foreign rate, which hopefully would offset a 10.5% U.S. rate on that guilty inclusion. Now there's a, as part of the Tax Reform Act, um, guilty um, will now have a separate basket for foreign tax credit purposes, and so there's a limitation. Um, that creates concerns for a lot of taxpayers. Um, we'll mention that uh, once again a little later, but um, uh, the concern there is that not all of the foreign taxes paid abroad may be utilized, and so there could be residual U.S. tax even when the foreign the controlled foreign corporation is paying more than 13 and 1 8 percent abroad. Um, the other concern uh, is that there's no carry forwards or carry backs for guilty related taxes. And so if you're in an excess uh, position where you've got excess credits, um, those credits essentially are lost. And so you, you have to use it or otherwise you lose it. Um, so in that sense, subpart F may be preferable for taxpayers. <clears throat> so just real quickly, what is guilty? What are we talking about, really? Um, essentially, guilty is, in the definitions of the code, the net tested income of the controlled foreign corporation less uh, the net deemed tangible income return. So what is net tested income? So you look at the CFC's <clears throat> gross income uh, with certain exclusions, uh, and then you, you back out the deductions. And... The exclusions are, are ones that um, you may be familiar with, but if a CFC has effectively connected income to the U.S. or subpart F income, or maybe subpart F that's been elected to be excluded under the high tax kickout, um, that income is not treated as guilty. So there are other provisions that deal with that. Um, so that, that would be excluded from net tested income. So you, but generally, you're looking at the gross income of the, of the controlled foreign corporation, back out those exclusions, and then you subtract out the deemed tangible income return. And, and that's basically a 10% return on uh, QBI, um, which is essentially the adjusted basis of the tangible property that the CFC has. So uh, the code essentially permits the CFC to earn a 10% return on those assets. That's excluded. Um, and then you, you back out some interest expense that's generally paid to unrelated persons. Um, 
<clears throat> now that Q buy, that 10% return of Q buy, I kind of look at that for corporations. That's kind of your DRD amount. Um, that's a permissible return that can then be paid up to the U.S. corporate shareholder um, and, and not be subject to U.S. tax. Or for maybe an individual, that's kind of your 956 exposure um, where you've got – that's permissible income that can be deferred. Um, beyond that, it, it's, it's guilty if it's not subpart F. And all these calculations, lastly, are done on an aggregate basis uh, for all of the CFCs. And then you, there's a netting that goes on. Um, so it, it's um, – when you're looking at all the CFCs collectively – to determine what is the guilty inclusion for the U.S. shareholder. Um, that's an overview of the rules, and so now let's uh, turn to Heather, and Heather, you can kind of walk us through some of the proposed reg um, issues. Sure. Thanks, Scott, and good morning, everyone. So last fall, uh, the IRS and Treasury released uh, the first round of proposed regulations on guilty under uh, 951 cap a and those rules focus on mainly d definitions and specific sort of computational guidance to determine the guilty inclusion um, so computing tested income and loss computing q by uh, specified interest expense and pro rata share um, and then uh, as you see there it also set forth some rules for partnerships and consolidated groups um, and uh, sort of Mis miscellaneous provisions um, that are dealt with in more detail under um, other regulation packages. So the, the starting point for guilty is tested income or loss, and there we begin with the CFC's gross income less the statutory exclusions that Scott mentioned uh, before under uh, 951 Cap A. Um, and so with regard specifically to the subpart F exclusion from, from tested income, uh, the regulations provided uh, a few clarifications, let's say. Uh, so first, all subpart F income for the year is excluded from guilty, even if that income isn't taxed or subject to immediate inclusion due to the EMP limitation that applies uh, to subpart F. Um, note um, here that uh, in contrast to the EMP limitation, guilty is not subject to an EMP limitation the way subpart F is. Um, then on the flip side, though, uh, subpart F recapture uh, in years when a CFC has sort of excess EMP, if you will, is not carved out of tested income. Um, so those rules are sort of working in tandem. Um, then the regulations also make clear that Tested income doesn't include foreign-based company or insurance income that is excluded from subpart F solely due to the high tax high tax kickout. Um, after uh, reaching gross income, next we deduct expenses uh, to determine tested income or loss, and those uh, deductions are determined generally under existing rules in Section 1.952-2. Treating the CFC essentially as if it were a domestic corporation. Um, under those rules, some items are not deductible or, or allowed against uh, tested income. Um, critically, NOL carryovers cannot be deducted in computing tested income or loss, which essentially means that a CFC's tested loss in one year cannot offset its tested income in later years. Uh, the proposed regulations also say that certain deductions that would otherwise be deferred, such as expenses or original is issue discount payable to related CFCs or related PFIX, um, which typically would be deferred until there was a corresponding inclusion by a U.S. shareholder uh, under subpart F, for example, um, those deferral rules are turned off for purposes of the tested income and or loss calculation for guilty purposes. Um, the regulations, uh, the proposed regulations did request comments on the operation uh, of, of the deduction rules under subpart F and, and their implications for guilty after uh, tax, their implications for um, 
for computing guilty um, in, in conjunction with other tax reform provisions. So, for example, if we're saying that the CFC is a domestic corp, does that mean it gets the Section 245 Cap A DRD? Um, other issues um, such as the interest expense limitation under 163J or the anti-hybrid rules um, are, have since been addressed in subsequent guidance uh, that Scott will uh, mention later. Um, yeah. So now turning to the, the next main component of, of, of the guilty computation, um, a percentage, 10% of QBI, is subtracted from tested income to determine guilty. Um, for the, uh, note that a tested loss CFC, a CFC where the, the deductions exceed its tested income, is not treated as having QBI uh, for purposes of the guilty rules. Um, because QBI reduces guilty exposure uh, mathematically based on the formula, the regulations introduce a number of anti-abuse rules in addition to the sort of quantitative mechanics. Um, so first, if a CFC temporarily acquires specified tangible property with a principal purpose to reduce guilty, that property is ignored in computing QBI. Um, and there's a presumption that property held less than 12 months but over a quarter end measurement date um, is held with improper uh, principal purpose motive, um, though presumably a taxpayer could rebut that presumption by showing, you know, business purpose and lack of, um, you know, principal purpose to reduce guilty. Uh, the second and third anti-abuse rules relate to asset transfers from fiscal year CFCs trying to essentially boost the Q by of other CFCs um, before uh, those transfer or CFCs became subject to guilty under the rules. Um, so uh, the, the first rule or the second anti-abuse rule in that regard disallows the basis step up for the transferee uh, CFC um, who receives prop property dur um, during, that, during that period before the transfer or um, the transfer or's first guilty inclusion year. And then the third rule relatedly denies depreciation as well as amortization deductions attributable to stepped up basis for uh, transfers during that period. So notably the third rule and disallowing uh, amortization deductions covers tangible and intangible property um, because those deductions are used to reduce tested and would typically reduce tested income. Um, so uh, that's an important distinction for that third rule. And notably, both the second and third anti-abuse rules uh, described on the slide there, those are apparently per se automatically applied rules uh, regardless of the taxpayer's purpose, um, good or bad, in, in making those transfers. Uh, the final ma major piece of uh, the guilty computation or inclusion computation is specified interest expense, um, which is, as Scott described, essentially boils down to interest paid to third parties or to related U.S. persons. Um, rather than uh, requiring specific tracing of interest expense of one CFC to whether it's included in income in another CFC, uh, the regulations adopt a sort of rule of administrative convenience and say that specified interest expense is simply the excess of a shareholder's pro rata share of the tested interest expense of all CFCs over its share of tested interest income of all CFCs. Um, less conveniently, the definition of interest is very broad, not limited uh, to interest treated as such um, for U.S. federal income tax purposes. Um, and this is this is similar to the the broad definition adopted under the interest uh, limitation rules in 163J. Um, and notably, interest income and expense of CFCs that are engaged in insurance or active financing are not uh, used to compute specified interest expense. Um, 
In the next slide, you'll see a discussion of the rules for determining a U.S. shareholder's pro rata share, um, which the guilty computation obviously depends on. Um, generally, the subpart F rules for pro rata share are borrowed for, this pur for guilty purposes, but there are limitations, um, particularly with respect to re preferred stocks. So you'll see there's a limitation on the QBI that can be allocated so that essentially the deemed tangible income return, 10% of QBI for preferred stockholders can at most only equal the tested income, uh, thus limiting the benefit of you know, reduced effective tax rate on guilty for preferred investors. Um, any excess would be attributed to the common stock. Um, also, you don't um, allocate tested losses to preferred stock except um, for certain dividend arrears. Um, they also, the proposed regulations also restrict um, allocation of tested losses to common, even to common stock that has no limit liquidation value, excuse me. Um, you also reduce the allocated tested loss uh, based on the number of year, uh, number of days in the year that the, the shareholder held uh, a tested loss, C, uh, loss CFC. I'm going to move uh, quickly just to the partnership and consolidated group rules. Um, so the proposed regulations set out uh, special rules for partnerships and consolidated groups. For domestic partnerships um, that are themselves U.S. shareholders of CFCs, the proposed rules ha take, a, take a hybrid approach in determining guilty for the respective partners. For partners that are not themselves U.S. shareholders, there's an entity approach. The guilty inclusion is determined at the partnership level and then allocated to those non-U.S. shareholder partners. So just to be clear, those small partners or non-U.S. shareholder partners do have guilty inclusions. It's just by way of the partnership, um, even though they are not U.S. shareholders of the underlying CFC. And then for partners that are themselves U.S. shareholders of the CFC, including through the partnership, an aggregate treatment applies. So those partners take into account their share of respective guilty components, tested income, uh, QBI, tested interest, income, and expense to compute guilty at the partner level rather than at the partnership level. Uh, and similar rules would apply to S corporations and their shareholders. Um, for consolidated groups, the regulations um, clarified that guilty would be done on a consolidated basis, meaning that pro rata shares of certain guilty components are aggregated and then allocated to members based on their proportionate share of the tested, the overall tested income of the group. And a benefit of that approach is that one member's um, tested loss CFCs can then offset um, tested income of another member's CFCs, uh, reducing the overall guilty inclusion. Um, finally, uh, the regs dealt with a number of other provisions uh, to, to varying degrees of detail. Um, a key provision would require a U.S. shareholder of a tested loss CFC to adjust its basis in the stock by tested loss that had been used to offset tested income. Um, immediately before disposing of the stock. So that rule is meant to prevent a duplicative benefit of the tested loss, though curiously there is no corresponding basis increase for stock of tested income CFCs whose income is offset. Um, the regulations also confirm that the guilty inclusion is computed before the Section 956 inclusion for U.S. property investments. Um, and then also that the Section 78 gross up for guilty would be included in the guilty foreign tax credit basket, uh, an issue that was elaborated on in the foreign tax credit regulations, um, which Scott will touch on briefly today and in more detail in the future talk he mentioned before. And so with that, I'll hand it back to Scott to go over um, guilty related implications for, for other regulatory packages. Thanks, Heather. Um, yeah, let's just turn briefly to a couple of these other um, proposed regs where guilty may be implicated. Uh, we're going to do separate uh, webinars on 
Section 250, as well as the foreign tax credit uh, provisions. So we're just touching on them here, and we'll do a little more of a deeper dive um, in a few weeks. I think one of the big takeaways from the proposed regs on 250 and the deduction for guilty was that Treasury has allowed individuals who make a 962 election for a CFC to claim the guilty deduction, um, which was <clears throat> a bit of a surprise, honestly. I think most practitioners, uh, at least that I was talking to, were uh, not confident that Treasury would adopt this approach um, and were actually expecting that the 250 deduction would not be available to taxpayers who make a 962 election, so it was a pleasant surprise. Um, but basically, if you look at, just to, uh, so we know what a 962 election is, if, if an individual owns an interest in a CFC and that CFC earns subpart F income or guilty, then the individual can make the selection under 962 to be taxed on that guilty income or subpart F income, essentially as a corporation. And so you get the benefit of uh, foreign tax credits. Um, there was a question as to whether taxpayers would get the benefit of the 50% deduction for guilty inclusions. Um, so Treasury came out and said, we're, we're going to allow that deduction. And I think what's interesting in this regard is that if you read the, the preamble to the proposed regs, Treasury went back and looked at um, the legislative history and they said, well, we looked at two options. We said, well, we could not give the deduction um, or we could give the deduction. And we, when we go back and we look at the legislative history, um, essentially the legislative history suggests that taxpayers should be no worse off if they make a, a 962 election um, than if they had invested in a U.S. corporation. And so Treasury's reasoning was that it would be economically costly, both legally and then just in economic costs, for individuals to have to start dropping all their CFCs into U.S. domestic corporations just to be eligible for the 50% um, the deduction. And so Treasury opted for um, allowing individuals who make the selection to get the the 50% deduction, and I, uh, that's very significant for a lot of individuals who own CFCs, and I suspect 962 elections are going to be common, or at least more common than they were previously. I think the the other issue, though, is that you've got to look at where the CFC is located, and so there's a potential trap because when the CFC actually makes a distribution of those earnings that have been picked up, there's a question as to whether they're eligible for qualified dividend treatment. So if you actually had a domestic corporation that owned a CFC and that money flowed up through the chain, when the money ultimately came out of the domestic corp, you'd get uh, a 20% tax rate on it and be a qualified dividend. But if the money's coming from directly from the CFC up to an individual, there's a question. If the CFC is in a treaty country, it's probably eligible. If it's in a non-treaty country, then <clears throat> a recent case essentially said you're not eligible for qualified dividend uh, treatment. And so there's a, a trap there for um, individuals. Uh, and so you want to be careful when you're assessing whether to make that election or not, because it, it may end up costing you down the road with the higher tax rate. Um, just real quick, uh, Section 250, there's also you know, an income limitation that um, in calculating what the deduction actually is and the Proposed regs introduce a, a complicated five-step rule to determine what the deduction is. What's that taxable income limitation off which the deduction is based? And the rule essentially goes through these five steps to arrive at a um, – to take into account interest expense limitations and NOLs. And so we'll review that in a few weeks, but um, it is a, a complicated rule. Uh, similar to what Heather was saying um, with respect to guilty, the 250 deduction is also determined on a consolidated basis um, and then allocated to members of the consolidated group based on their relative contributions. Um, so that at least is coordinated between the guilty inclusion and the deduction. Um, <clears throat> and then um, the, the regs can be – the 250 regs can be relied on for prior years. Um, so let's turn now to the uh, foreign tax credit uh, proposed regs. We're a little bit over. 
All right, so these regulations <clears throat> uh, came out recently, late uh, November, and essentially can also be applied uh, retroactively um, to years beginning after for 2018. And I think the big takeaway here is that practitioners were hoping that there would be no allocation of expenses to this new guilty basket. So your guilty inclusion is going to be segregated into a separate basket um, and the foreign tax credit limitation applied to that basket. And so in the legislative history, Congress said, well, if the, if the controlled foreign corporation is paying a certain threshold of tax, namely 13%, then there should be no U.S. residual tax on that income. And so the, the feeling was, well, to really implement that intent, there should be no allocation of expenses that would reduce the foreign source income. And basically, Treasury said, well, no, uh, we're going to, we think allocating expenses um, is called for because there weren't other amendments to uh, provisions in the code um, that would affect that intent. Um, and so, as a result, they did provide some relief, and so to the extent that the 50% deduction on a guilty inclusion uh, is applied, that's treated as exempt income, um, and then when you're looking at the asset with respect to the controlled foreign corporation, where you have that deduction for the guilty inclusion, then a portion of the stock of that CFC is treated as an exempt asset. Um, and so by having this kind of category of exempt, exempt income and exempt assets, the, the net effect is that you're reducing the allocation of expenses to the guilty basket. Um, it's not exactly what practitioners were hoping for. It's some relief, um, but it doesn't quite go all the way. And so essentially um, what this does is it ties back to something that Sam had mentioned a few weeks ago is what taxpayers are looking at is do I want to fall into subpart F? Um, is subpart F a better result for me than guilty? Because if I, if I have this limitation on the ability to claim foreign taxes and I'm creating potentially residual U.S. tax, then maybe it's better that I don't have a guilty inclusion but I have a subpart F inclusion where I've got more flexibility on utilization of my foreign tax credits. Um, or maybe I'm taxed at a higher rate and I want to use the high tax kickout. <clears throat> Subpart F uh, would provide more flexibility with, when you have um, uh, the carry forward ability as well. You don't have this permanent disallowance that you do in the guilty basket. So I, I think that's a, a very serious um, uh, topic that companies need to look at when they're assessing what's my guilty exposure and are there ways that I can plan into subpart F and would that be more beneficial for me? Um, so uh, just to kind of conclude on this slide, uh, some other ways that Treasury helped uh, a little bit was to say that the deduction, the 50% deduction is allocated uh, to guilty um, and so that effectively reduces the allocation to the guilty basket and then um, the gross up so the 78 gross up on the guilty inclusion is also assigned to the guilty basket, increasing uh, your foreign source income there. Um, and then no carry forwards or carry backs on that guilty basket taxes. So that's, you know, you, you got to use them. Um, lastly, just turn quickly. This is just some other tangential related issues for guilty. Um, it, it's hard to revisit 163J. Jack Cummings did a presentation on that for us a few weeks back. Um, but basically, there's there's a lot of interplay between 163J and guilty. The 163J limitation does apply to CFCs um, in computing subpart F and guilty income. That's important. And then when you're computing your adjusted taxable income at the shareholder level, essentially what the regs are designed to do is avoid double counting. So if you've already applied the <clears throat> limitation down at the CFC level, you want to avoid double counting at the at the shareholder level, and so there's a coordination rule there. Um, lastly, I just on this last bullet point, um, Jack referred to this as the partnership morass, which I think is absolutely appropriate. These partnership rules are very difficult and ripe for technical corrections, which we may not get anytime soon. Um, but effectively, um, 
the rules are characterizing partnership investment interest as, as business interest to a, a C Corp partner. Those rules don't apply where you have guilty allocated to a C Corp partner. And so it, it you have interest expense, investment interest expense allocable to the partner um, and not recharacterize as business interest to the C Corp. Um, just one coordination rule. Um, and then finally on, just real quick, the hybrid rules. The statute under 267 Cap A does say that the disallowance of a deduction doesn't apply where there's a, an inclusion under subpart F. That's expressly in the statute. The regs also adopt that uh, rule for guilty inclusion. So to the extent you would otherwise have a 267 Cap A disallowance for a hybrid payment to a related foreign entity, um, that would <clears throat> be turned off if there's a guilty inclusion uh, and the deduction would be allowed to the U.S. payor. Um, so that's a high level of some of the other provisions implicated. Um, any other uh, concluding thoughts, Heather, uh, takeaways? Um, I don't think so. Uh, that pretty much hit it. Um, yeah. I mean, I, th I think that, uh, you know, kind of the point uh, for me on a lot of this is as we dig into the foreign tax credit rules and these other provisions, guilty, as I said, initially has a lot of tentacles and it spreads far and draws mm -hmm. in, uh, you know, 163J and 250 and 904. Um, and so yeah. th these calculations are incredibly complex. Um, so uh, this is an overview, but... Um, it, it's definitely something that will require a lot of attention for a number of taxpayers, whether they be large corporations or even mid-sized businesses. Yeah, mm -hmm. or individuals. Yeah, yeah, I mean, individuals, if you're S-Corps, LLCs, um, yeah. very significant calculations, and then you have to assess whether you want to look at making 962 elections or, or dropping into a, a C-Corp yeah. structure. So it's um, a, a lot to digest yeah um okay <clears throat> well i am um, sorry we went a little long heather thanks for joining us um but there is a lot there um these slides are available uh to download as always if you have questions please please email us and we are happy to talk through uh, these issues with you next week we are going to look at previously taxed emp and jack cummings will join us and um have some good presentations after that on foreign tax credits um, so thanks, everyone, for joining us. We appreciate your participation, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.